We're glad that you guys are here today. We start um, a new series today, and I'm calling this series Advent. Our sermon for today is called Image, but this series will be called Advent, and it's going to go for the next seven weeks, which is going to be a longer series than any we've done since January. But uh, if, if you have started joining us since January, I'll have you know that um, like, I think my longest series ever was something like 22 months and, uh, and so I, I've pulled it back a little bit, you know, and so that it's a little more bite sized a little more manageable, and so we can keep up with it. But Advent is talking about, the, the term Advent talks about the coming of Christ, and so when you hear people talk about Advent, it's talking about the first coming of Christ. When people talk about the second Advent or the second coming of Christ, they mean his return, at which point we will be joined with him forever in heaven. But this, we're going to develop this over seven weeks. And I'm going to give away like way too many spoilers today of what's coming in the next few weeks. And so if you're one of those kinds of people that, you know, you, you like spoilers, you're really going to enjoy this one today. And if you don't like spoilers, you're like, man, now you've ruined the next six sermons for me. Um, well, I'm sorry, you're going to have to deal with that. So uh, we're talking today about image. We're talking about what it means or a little bit about imaging God. Our theology today is this. God made mankind to image him. God made mankind to image him. Our application is live for God's image rather than your own. And our prayer today is God help us to keep your fame as central to our lives. What does it mean that God made mankind in his image? Turn, if you would, please, to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, that's where we'll start this series on the coming of Jesus. Genesis 1. And I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. Lord God, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for this time that we can come together to fellowship. God, we do praise you and thank you that Lacan is doing so well and that he's home and that he's recovering. We pray that Micah would recover soon and we pray that Cammie and the boys wouldn't get sick. We thank you, God, for this opportunity that we have to come together today and to fellowship and not just to fellowship, Lord, but to worship you, the living God, and to know you in your word and to encounter you more fully and more richly. We pray, God, that you would teach us today, that you would encourage us, that you would strengthen us, and, Lord, that you would cause this fellowship to be sweet. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You know, it's interesting because... Um, I, Genesis 1 is, is, I don't know, I mean, like, if you, if you grew up going to church, like, you've, you've drawn these pictures, you've colored these pictures, you've seen them on felt boards, you know, like the creation of the world, and so here's God making all things, and it's funny because um, there are a lot of people now I'm noticing, and it's not like it's lately, it's, it's probably been the last decade or so, but there are a lot of people who, who are moving away from Genesis 1 as, as history. And they're moving to Genesis 1 as allegory. And they're saying, well, you know, Genesis 1 didn't really happen this way. And they say, God, God, you know, I mean, God's the creator, but Genesis 1 isn't really a model for that. It's just a story that we tell people. I, I will have you know, and I'm happy to talk about it with you in more detail, but I will have you know that I, I don't believe that Genesis 1... Uh, is just an allegory. I don't believe that it's fiction. I don't believe that it's just uh, a snapshot of a way for us to understand it. I believe that this is what actually happened. In fact, most people who say that Genesis 1 is just an allegory and just a story, they say that that's true all the way through Genesis 11. They say the first 11 chapters of Genesis, Tower of Babel, all of that, uh, Noah's Ark, that it's all fiction just so that we can understand uh, God. In fact, the extreme people say that Job is just a play, that the book of Job isn't real, that there's no character Job. Uh, the extreme people say that the devil is just an idea, not a real person. And it is interesting that more and more people, I guess not interesting, it's sad, that more and more people are moving away from an understanding of the Bible as truth to an understanding of the Bible as pieces of, of fiction that, you know, are pretty good to keep around. And that is just not our view. Our view is not that the Bible is fiction, but that it is the word of God written by God uh, or written by people who have been inspired by God. We hold to what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2 Peter chapter 1 that no one penned any of this 
apart from the direction of the Holy Spirit upon their lives, that this is, these words are good for us and that they help us to understand who God is and to come to know him better and to come to understand who Jesus is as God and as the Savior of mankind. And so when we're looking at Genesis 1 today, uh, I, I look at Genesis 1 as truth, as real, as actually happening. And it's interesting because the New Testament writers treat it that way too. The New Testament writers, the people who are writing about Jesus and talking about Christ and even some of the stuff that Jesus quotes in the New Testament shows that they believe that these things actually happened in this way. And so here we are, Genesis 1, and on day 1, God creates. And on day 2, God creates. Day 3, 4, 5, and 6, God creates. And on day 6, beginning in verse 26, so Genesis 1, 26, it says this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image after our own likeness. You'll notice that God is using plural there. Uh, let us make man in our image in our own likeness. We hold that that is because the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all instrumental in creating. And let them have dominion, let mankind have dominion over the fish of the seas, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man or mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God created mankind in his own image, male and female, he made them in the image of God. And the very first command he gives them is subdue the earth and fill it. A couple of things, let's, before we get to the command, let's deal with what it means to be made in the image of God. Occasionally, I don't bump into this as much as I used to, but occasionally you will bump into people who will argue that to be made in the image of God has something to do with how we look, that there is something about how we look that is reminiscent of who God is, there are a lot of problems with that. I will highlight for you three. One of the problems with that is that when the prophets of old, and we've talked about this several weeks ago, but when the prophets of old would describe God, they had a very difficult time describing God. And so they would say, well, it looks like he's glowing metal from the waist up and fire from the waist down. Or they'd say his face is as bright as the sun, or he's surrounded by rainbows, or his voice is like a mighty rushing waterfall or an army shouting in, in its battle cry. And, and they would talk about him uh, stepping down on the mountain in Exodus 18, and then the whole mountain shaking, and that it, it's covered with smoke, and the mountain looks like it's on fire. There's all these pictures of God surrounded by rainbows, surrounded by six-winged seraphim with crying out holy 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 surrounded by smoke like all these images of God that are meant to make us go wow like he, there's there's something about God that is beyond description there is something about his his I don't even want to say form there is something about his very nature that defies description and and you and I are quite describable <laughs> uh, right like you can uh, you might not be good at describing somebody. I don't know if you've ever been in this situation. Hey, do you, what's that guy's name? I do this all the time because I can't remember people's names to save my life. If I don't call you by your name, it, it's not personal. I promise. Uh, I, I'm working on it. I'm just really bad at it. And so I'll say to Michelle, like, what's that person's name? You know, the one that has like a, and then I get really bad. Like, I, I've written stuff, I've painted things, and all of a sudden, all the descriptive words are gone. You know the one that, like, has the, the, the hair and, the, you know, the, they've got, like, a beard or not a beard anymore, right, Russell? And so, like, uh, and, 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 you know, like, they, their shirt was blue, and she goes, the person who was wearing the, the green shirt? I'm like, yeah, that one. Who was that one? And she'll tell me, right? And so, like, we're, but we're, we're describable, um, the only thing about me that I've ever really, let me say it differently, because I've come to like myself a little bit these days. I used to hate myself, but the only thing that I've consistently liked about myself is my blue eyes. Uh, ever since I was a kid, like people liked my blue eyes. My mom did not. My mom did not like my blue eyes. She called them the Douglas curse. Uh, and and uh, that was because my dad had the blue eyes and because, let's just, it didn't go well. We'll leave it at that if you want more details another time. But anyway, I'll never forget the first compliment I ever received from somebody that wasn't like a family member. And I was standing in the lunch line in seventh grade and an eighth grade girl standing in front of me. I, I, seventh grade, I weighed like 65 pounds um, and I was about like that tall. And, uh, and she's standing in front of me and she goes, you're not much, but man, you got good looking eyes. 
And, and I just remember, like, all I heard was the second part, you know? And I was like, I got the eyes, you know? Uh, but we can, we can describe people and we can say, you know, oh, so-and-so, they're like... Uh, they look like this or they look like that. God is beyond description. Like, that's why these authors are, they're like, man, he, he's kind of like lightning, you know? He's kind of like, his voice is like, a, hey, have you ever heard an army shouting its cry in battle? He, his voice is kind of like that. Or have you ever, and that's how people, so the, the first problem that I have with saying that when God created mankind in his image, that we look like him, the first problem that I have is you and I are describable and God's not. It's the first problem that I have. The second problem that I have is these bodies that we have right now aren't the bodies that we take with us into eternity. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that these bodies die. Flesh and blood doesn't inherit eternity. These bodies come to corruption. These bodies fail. Some of you feel that in your body every morning when you wake up. You're like, man, I'm failing a little bit more today than I was yesterday. You know, your body is, is slowly coming to an end and we get new bodies. So if these are the bodies that are supposed to look physically like God, and these aren't even the bodies we keep forever, there's a problem with that. But the third, and I think the most compelling argument that when God says he made mankind in his image, the third and most compelling argument that we do not look like God is this. Go, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Flip over a little bit, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy uh, and flip over or turn in your, you don't turn in your phone, but you can scroll in your phone or whatever, type in in your phone, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Now, God has already told the people in Exodus 20, in, in part of the Ten Commandments, God has already told the people to make no image. You shall not make for yourself an idol or an image or the likeness of that which is in heaven above or on the earth below or in the waters below the earth to worship it. God's already told the people, don't build an idol, don't fashion an idol to worship it. A little more detail is given in Deuteronomy 4, 15. 15 through 19. Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 19. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb. He was covered in a cloud, covered in fire, standing on the mountain. Since you saw no form of the Lord what spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourself in the form of any figure, in the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven and you see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the hosts of heaven and you're drawn away and you bow down to them and you serve them. Uh, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heavens. Here's what he says. God says, do not fashion an idol after the form of anything. An idol, do not fashion an idol after the form of anything, not in the likeness of man, not in the likeness of woman, not in the likeness of any beast upon the earth or any winged bird. I like winged. It sounds fancier than winged, you know, I don't know. Anyway, any winged bird that flies up in the sky, don't, don't, don't uh, make an idol after anything that swims in the depths of the oceans. Don't worship the sun, the moon, or the stars. Don't make an idol for worship after any form or structure that you have beheld. So, because God says that's idolatry. It's, it, it's, it's below God. It's less than God. It's sub-God, okay? And so he's saying don't make an, an idol after the form of anything. And so if we're going to say, look, like, hey, you and I, if we're going to say God made mankind in his image so God looks like us, and then we have this drawing of some old man sitting on the throne, you know, like whatever, and he's got, he's got you know, two legs and two arms, and he's got a big beard, you know, but really bright, you know, eyes, and he's got this kind of like halo-y thing going on around him or whatever. Like we go, see, he kind of looks like us. God is going to kind of look like us. And we, the, the problem, right, three problems. One, God's beyond description and we're describable. Two, these bodies don't inherit the kingdom of heaven, so these aren't the permanent ones. And then three, God said any image that you make that you say this is what God is like is idolatrous. And so that would include you and I. If we were going to argue that, hey, you and I, we look like God, there's a problem with that because we don't look like God. So then what does it mean? What does it mean? I, I've had a lot of people, I'll, I'll address this really quickly, but I've had a lot of people through the years who have said, well, you're an artist and you're a preacher, so why aren't you painting like, you know, they want me to paint. The one that I get asked the most is the woman at the well. 
Uh, in John chapter four, Jesus talking to the woman at the well. Uh, and the second one that I get asked to paint the most is um, the last night of the life of Christ where he's washing the disciples' feet. And I will just tell you a couple of things. One, I really love the scripture. I really, really do. And I really love painting. Uh, I, I would never, ever like one of my paintings with a religious theme. I just wouldn't. Um, I, I wouldn't ever feel like I'd done a good enough job. I wouldn't have ever felt like I captured what I wanted to capture. I wouldn't have, like, I, I just wouldn't. And nothing against the Renaissance paintings and none of, nothing against the people who are painting religious kind of things today. That's fine. But, like, there's something about it that I'm just like, man, I just, uh, I wouldn't ever like it, you know? I just wouldn't ever be happy with it. Um, God says, and this is not, if you have religious art in your house, that's fine. God says, don't form anything, don't make anything, don't create any image for the sake of worship that looks like mankind, that looks like animals, that looks like birds, that looks like fish, that looks like the sun, moon, or the stars. These things are not God. So then what does it mean that you and I are made in the image of God? If it has nothing to do with our height or our hair or our facial features, what does it mean that we are made in the image of God? Well, part of that, Part of that answer, I think, shows up in the command. So God said, let us make mankind in our own image, in our own likeness, let us make them. So he made them in, the, in his own image, in his own likeness, he created them. And then what's the command? Genesis 1, fill the earth and subdue it. Fill the earth and subdue it. And then he says, rule over the fish, rule over the creatures of the, of the sea and the creatures of the land. But there's something interesting in that. When he says, fill the earth and subdue it, the the initial take on it, the initial take on it is this, have a lot of kids, fill the earth. But I, but I, don't, I don't think that that's really what God is saying here. I think that what God is saying is, here is this, I've created mankind in my image, now fill the earth with what? The image of God. That God's aim for us as image bearers of his is that we would fill the earth with his image, that there is something uh, some core component of who we are as people that images the nature and the person of God. Not in likeness, not in physical form, but at the heart of what we are. Now, I will tell you this. I cannot think of a verse in the Bible. I cannot think of a text in the Bible that would tell us what that is. Some people want to say it's the soul. Some people want to say that it's our ability to know the difference between right and wrong. Some people want to say it's our ability to love. Those are all fine answers, but none of them are in the scripture. So what does it mean? What does it really mean for us to image God? What does it really mean? If it's not our physical form, and maybe it's knowing the difference between right and wrong, and maybe it's love, and maybe it's kindness, and maybe it's, maybe it's these things. Maybe it's our soul. Maybe it's that we have an eternal component. Maybe, maybe, maybe. What does it mean for us to image God? Well, I, I do think there's an answer, but it's Sermon 7 in this series, right? So I'm just going to have to tell you thanks for coming and have a great day and hope everybody's had a really nice week. No, I'm just kidding. The, what, I want, what I want us to grasp is that there is a component in imaging God that has as its purpose making much of God and glorifying God in, our, in the earth, there is something about imaging God that magnifies who God is, that has at a, as its core uh, making much of God. So God made mankind to image him. God made mankind to image him. That's our theology. Our application today is live for God's image rather than your own. Live for God's image rather than your own. What does, it, what does it mean to have in mind the image and the glory of God? What does it mean to have in mind that my life is about imaging God? Now, the answer, here's, one of, here's spoiler number one of a whole bunch that I'm probably going to give you in the next few minutes. The, the answer is tied up in the story of Christ. Remember that the sermon series, these seven weeks, is Advent. We are doing this series of creation of mankind all the way to Christ. 
That's what we're doing. We're doing this kind of like, it, it, it's the narrative of the scripture, if you will. What we're going to leave off is the second advent. We can do another series on that another time. But what we're going to do is we're going to do this story arc of Adam and Eve, mankind, created to image God all the way to Christ. And, and there is something core. I think that there's an answer in it, and I, I plan on giving you that answer, just not this morning. You ever watch, you ever watch infomercials? Or something uh, where they're like teasing something like, we're going to show you what that is right after this. And then they never show you. And you watch through like four commercial breaks. And you're like, come on, just show me already. I want to know like how this works. Like, what's this thing? I'm kind of doing that to you today. I'm an infomercial, if you will. God, God has given us Christ. So here, here it is. We were created. We were created to image God. And for us to image God well, because all of us will fail at it on our own, for us to image God well, for us to fulfill God's purpose for us, requires Jesus. That's the end of the story. That's the end of the story. When I say to you today that your purpose in life is to image and glorify God, if you feel a little bit overwhelmed by that, if you feel a little bit heavy by that, if you feel a little bit even discouraged by that and going, how in the world with my life, knowing what my life looks like, how in the world am I supposed to image and glorify God? The great news is that God who designed you to image and glorify him has also designed the way by which you do that through faith in Jesus. That God has made it possible, has to, to image him and glorify him well on the earth through Jesus Christ. But that's the end of the story. You just got to bear with me. So here we are. We have been created to image and glorify God. Think about this for a moment. The Bible, uh, which I love, which I believe, which I hold to, the Bible talks in Psalm 139, it says this. It says that before a single one of our days were, were before we were born, before one of our days happened, it says that God had written them all out before one of them came to pass. I don't know. I don't know if there's like an actual book with the story of Ryan in it. But what I do know that the psalmist means is that every single one of my days, God knew it before I drew my first breath. I also know that the Bible says, Jesus says that man worries about life or death, and yet we can't number the hairs on our own head. He goes, why are you bothered by that? He goes, God knows the number of every hair on your head. He says, not even a sparrow falls to the ground apart from the will of God, and you're worried about your own life? I know that our fragile lives, our small lives, are in the hands of God. I know that Daniel chapter 4 says that God holds the breath of mankind in his hands. I know that you and I were given life by God for the purpose of imaging him and glorifying him. And I want you to hear me say this. I feel sometimes like my life is just kind of monotonous and mundane. Sometimes. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. You just kind of get into the routine and six months have gone by and you're like, man, what is, what's happened? You know, how did I come to this place? And you get up in the morning and you do the same thing that you did yesterday and the day before and the day before and you have the same breakfast and the same coffee and you go and you do the same job and then you get home and there's food on the table or you put the food on the table and the kids, you help them with their homework and then you got to get this done, but the lawn's got to get mowed and the bills have got to get paid and the fence still has to be built a year later. And like, you're just, you just kind of go, man, when does it stop? And if you're an adult, you realize that it doesn't, right? We were talking about this yesterday. I was like, man, because I've said for a long time that my least favorite part of an, a, being an adult is having to set an alarm. Um, I, I, don't, I don't like getting up in the mornings. But then I realized, you know, my boys set their alarms. They get up in the morning. So I thought, okay, so that's not an inherently a, an adult thing, you know, having to get up in the morning. I was like, okay, my new thing, I told Michelle yesterday, my new thing that I don't like about being an adult is there's always something else to do. It never stops. I don't know if you know that, but like it just keeps coming. There's always something else that has to get done. Always. My poor wife, uh, she keeps us in clothes and clean dishes and the house is clean. And every time, and if you were at Bible study Wednesday night, you know that I create a lot of dirty clothes because if I've worn anything for any length of time, it's dirty. It doesn't matter if I changed my mind about what shirt I was going to wear. You know, like I, I just think like, it, it never stops. My poor wife, like, life, work never stops. The bills never quit coming, you know? And if, if you don't pay them fast enough, they call you to remind you, give you a friendly reminder, you know? And I just think, like, sometimes we get so locked into that, just kind of survival mode. Have you ever felt that way? Like you're surviving? Maybe a year goes by and you're like, man, we made it. 
You ever feel like that? Here's the thing. Catch this, please. Just because your life feels mundane doesn't mean your purpose is. You and I might be plain and ordinary people in the scheme of things. But our purpose isn't plain and ordinary. We were fashioned by God for the purpose of imaging him and glorifying him. You know, Micah and I have some really good friends down in Houston. Micah has preached down there a lot more than I have, but we've known this church for something like 12 years now. We've been friends with this church, maybe not quite that long, nine years, 10 years. But there's a, there's a, a really good friend of ours down there. And a few years ago, I don't know, four or five years ago, Michelle might remember, but four or five years ago, I got a call from a church in Alabama um, and they wanted me to come and be their college minister. Um, they, uh, they, have, they were right across from the University of Alabama, the church was, and so they, they ran somewhere between 500 and 700 college students, and they said, we want you to come up here, we want you to head up our college program, and we want you to, to pastor our college and to build kind of the, the college ministry. And, uh, and I just said, no, you know, I'm good. And at that point, I was pastoring like 30 people. The 456 was like 30 people. And this buddy of mine down in, down in uh, Houston, the next time I was down there for a visit, he goes, man, you, you made a mistake. And he goes, I said, why? We're, we're sitting at breakfast, like an IHOP or something. And I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, you had the chance to be in front of 500 people. He goes, I mean, I'm really glad that you're doing what you're doing in San Angelo. He's like, but seriously, how many people are you going to impact there? I was like, 40. And he goes, yeah, but it could be 500. And I was like, I was like, yeah, I, I have no interest in that. And he goes, why? And I was like, well, for one, right now, I'm working with Micah. Pierce, I think, had just come on. And I was like, we get to kind of do what we want to do, <laughs> you know? And I was like, I don't get taught, I get, don't get told what I can teach or can't teach. Uh, like, I was like, I just, I don't have any interest in the politics. My wife's entire family lives in San Angelo. My kids' best friends are their cousins who live in San Angelo. I was like, I'm good with the 40. Yeah, but you could be, and I was like, I'm good with the 40. And now we have 120, right? I, I will, please hear me say this. And, and, and try to understand it. I, I hope I can be clear and not... It, Pierce, you might have to tell me, say that again. I, I plan on dying here. We love Dove Creek. We love living in the country. I plan on dying at the 456. Now, it doesn't mean that I won't, you know, get to a point where I'm a little bit older and have to preach less or whatever. But as long as I have breath, this is where I plan on being. And I plan on that because I believe with all my heart this is where God has planted us. I believe that Micah and Pierce and I, that we're here. Micah gets offered like three jobs a year. And he says, man, no, I'm supposed to be at the 456. That's where I'm supposed to be. And people are like, yeah, but you're like out in West Texas and you could be in a bigger city. And you're like, listen, we're not chasing anything other than that God would be known. That's it. And let me ask you this question. Some of you who have lived in this area and this church was empty for two years, like, let, let me ask you this question. And just, it can be rhetorical. You don't have to answer out loud, but shouldn't something be happening out here? Shouldn't somebody be proclaiming Jesus here? Like, look at this place, right? Like, shouldn't, shouldn't something be going on here? Right? Right? And, and shouldn't it be somebody who's not looking at this as a stepping stone? Who's not going, man, I'm going to be here for a couple of years till I can get the promotion. Shouldn't it be somebody who says, this is where I want to be and the people I want to be with? Why? Because I have no interest in my own image, but the image of God. And I have friends who love me who go, yeah, but dude, you're settling. And I go, listen, let my life be mundane. And I'm not saying that you are mundane or that this church is mundane. I'm just saying, you, you get it, right? Did you know that the average lifespan of a pastor at any church is less than 18 months? That's the average. Do you know why? Because many, and I don't want to throw them all under the bus, many of them take a pastorate as a stepping stone to the job they really want. 
And I will tell you that we are not here about our own image or our own fame or our own glory. Let me be the little nothing pastor that lives in the country that preaches to 40 for 10 years and then it grows to 120. Let me be the little guy that can't fix the plumbing that has to call the neighbor to help. You know, let, let me be that guy. Let my life be plain and ordinary and mundane who can't really, I, I, I am embarrassed to say this, who can't really cook a great steak. So I have like five of you going, oh man, we got to fix that. Thank you. That sounds great. Instead, you fix the great steak and I'll hang out. We'll talk. I'm good being that guy. Why? Let my life be mundane because my purpose isn't mundane. My purpose is the image and glorification of God. You and I, here's what I'm saying. Your life may feel boring. Your purpose isn't. Your life may feel monotonous. Your purpose isn't. Your life might feel like you're stuck, but the, the intent of which God made you was to image him and to glorify him. And we will get to the punchline in six more weeks of what that looks like. But suffice it to say, you can't and I can't on our own ability image God. It requires who Jesus is in us. And as we put faith in God through Jesus and we say, Jesus, you are my righteousness. Jesus, you are my holiness. Jesus, you are my savior. That in that, in that relationship through faith with God, we image him. A friend of mine posted on, on Facebook the other day. Uh, I hate Facebook right now. Uh, but a friend of mine posted on Facebook the other day and they said, and they cited three things. I won't get into them now because there's no point in being political about it. But they cited three things and they said, somebody tell me a, a non-religious reason for living life this way. And they named three things. Non-religious, they said. And I thought, that's impossible because all of my reasons for making these decisions are because of Christ. Like, have you ever, have you had that happen yet, Christian? Have you had that happen where somebody says, tell me what you think, but you can't use Jesus? No, listen, Jesus forms and shapes everything about who I am. I had an atheist guy come up to me when I used to, uh, when I first moved to town, I used to spend evenings at the coffee shop at Baker Street there. And I had this atheist come up to me one day and he said this, he goes, he goes, I want to ask you some questions. I said, sure, grab a seat. And he goes, you can't use the Bible or talk about Jesus. I was like, well, see you later. <laughs> and he goes, what? And I was like, look, I was like, I don't know what you believe, but I'm not going to tell you you can't use your, your beliefs. I was like, if you want to talk to me, you just need to know everything is going to come through the lens of Jesus, every bit of it. And he goes, okay. And so we started talking. And I was very careful because I could tell he was very angry. I was very careful. So anytime he would make some, a suggestion or something, I would turn to a text and I'd read the text. And that's all I would do. And then he'd get really mad. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. you're not mad at me. You're mad at God. And he goes, all right, well, what about this? And I'd flip and I'd read him another text. And then he'd get really mad. I'd be like, no, 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 you're not mad at me. You're mad at God. And so we did this for like two hours. He was mad at God a lot in two hours. But at the end of it, he got up and he said, I don't agree with a single thing you've said, but you're the most Christian Christian I've ever met. <laughs> and here's what he meant. Here's what he meant. I said, I'm standing for Christ, right? People say, what do you do every evening? I sit in a coffee shop. This was back in the day, before Michelle, before kids. What do you do every evening? I sit in the coffee shop. What do you do there? I read and I talk. Why? I like it. I like to read. <laughs> I like to talk. Seems, it seems boring. It seems mundane. Yeah, maybe. But my purpose isn't boring or mundane. I'm not going to be able to tell you. If you're looking for me to give you a step-by-step, -step, a one, two, three of what it means to image God, that's not going to be able to happen. The Bible doesn't tell us. But the Bible does tell us that in Christ, we image God. That when we are joined to Jesus, when we put our faith in Jesus, we are image bearers of God. So there is something about imaging God that has to do with our faith and our belief in him. That what our lives declare about him images him and, and, it, and it falls in line with the commandment that he gave Adam and Eve. 
I've built these two people to image me so that they could fill the earth, so they could subdue the earth with the image of God. You have been joined together. You who are married, you who are about to be married, you're joined together. Uh, you who are in school, you students, you're not just in the school you're in, in the classes you're in, sitting next to the kids you're in, just so that you can make friends and just so that your grades can be good or mediocre or better than they were last six weeks. You are where you are for the purpose of imaging God. So that everywhere, everywhere we go, the image of God goes. It has to do with something. I wish I could just pin it down for you and just say this is what it is, but the Bible just doesn't do that. It has something to do with our declaration about who he is, our belief in who he is, our faith in what he's done through Jesus. But we were made to image him. What we're going to see next week is that Adam and Eve took the image of God that they were supposed to fill the earth with, and they ruptured it. They destroyed it through sin. And you and I are left, feel, left holding the bag going, man, how am I ever going to image God? And the beauty is that God, who looks into our mundane lives, our normal, everyday lives, where you think, ah, I can't make a difference, here me. My life, my life's purpose isn't higher than your life's purpose. I'm not set apart because I'm a preacher and you're not. You and I both have the same purpose and that is image and glorify God in everything you're doing. The, the team you're on, the games you play, the things you do, kids, students, like, man, there are people around you who don't know Jesus. There are people around you who do not understand that there is a God in heaven that loves them. There are people around you who have no concept that they are loved by God, that they were made by God, and that they are for his glory. There are people everywhere. There are people in your workplace. There are people at the store. There, like Everywhere we go, we are to subdue the earth and fill it with what? The image and the glory of God. Now, before you leave here feeling incredibly overwhelmed, remember the spoiler that it doesn't rest on your effort and it doesn't rest on your ability. It rests upon your faith in God. God, who made us to image him, also makes us able to image him. Do you understand that? God who has made us to image him has also made us able to image him through Christ. But we'll get into that in a couple of weeks. Live for God's image rather than your own. Listen. How many, let me, let me ask this question. How many of you heard uh, yesterday about Sean Connery's death? Show of hands. Not as many as I expected. Some of you aren't answering. Some of you are like, who's Sean Connery? Uh, <laughs> worldwide, how many people think you think, you know, like percentage-wise, if you had to guess, how many people know about Sean Connery's death today less than 24 hours later? A good chunk, right? How many people are going to know about mine? Not as many. Not even close. No one's going to put it on Facebook. No one's going to blast it on all the news feeds. Like, it's not going to be anywhere. It's not going to be on your news alert when you wake up that morning and open your phone. It's just not. In fact, it might be a few days before any of you ever hear about it. And if you're still coming to this church, you might show up Sunday and be like, where's Ryan? Oh, he died. <laughs> wow, that's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> Caught us by surprise. Here's, the, here's my point. Listen, I'm, by the way, if you don't know this, I'm very dark about death. Uh, sorry. Um, I mean, sorry that you didn't know that. Not sorry that I'm dark about it. At some point, this all comes to an end, and I close my eyes in death, and I open them before the living God. At some point, I stamp, I step, that was stand and step, I stamp into the presence of the living God, righteous and holy because of Jesus. Forgiven, loved, adored, child of God. And when Jesus comes back, I get my glorified body and we stand before God forever in glory with the pleasure and fullness of joy abundantly uh, just lavished on us in all blessing, in all righteousness, in all holiness. At some point, this, 
this comes to an end. And the forever gets kicked off. Forever. And we were created for that. Not for this. So when my choices center around this, this temporary, rather than that eternal, and this isn't a critique of your job, this isn't a critique of your favorite TV shows, this isn't a critique of your favorite music, or how you like to spend your free time, do all of those things, and that's fine. But do them not with this life in view, but that one. We talked about that a little bit last week, right? Do, do life with the mindset of when I get up in the morning at 6.30 and I put together the boys' lunch and get their breakfast on the table and some of you crazy people who get up earlier than that, when I get up in the morning at 6.30 and I kick off my day, yesterday I was grumbling a lot. I had to apologize to my wife this morning. I was like, I grumbled a lot yesterday. Saturday was supposed to be my day off. There was a lot that was not day offy about yesterday and I didn't like it. <laughs> And maybe I would have grumbled a little bit less if I had remembered that this monotony of life, this list that just keeps growing and the responsibilities that keep coming aren't outside of my purpose of glorifying God, but completely swallowed up by my purpose of glorifying God. So that job that you have, that's putting food on the table, that's allowing you to interact with your coworkers, that's doing whatever, is not outside of God's purpose of you glorifying them, but completely within it because every one of your days was written in a book before one of them came to be. You and I have extraordinary purpose, even if our lives are very ordinary. Ordinary life is not anything to be ashamed of. Let's live our ordinary lives with extraordinary purpose. That of imaging and glorifying God. Now next week we're going to talk about how all that went sideways. Right after God made Adam and Eve. He created them to image him. Then sin. And all of that was shattered. But for you and I who have put faith in Jesus Christ... It's been restored. And now we can image and glorify God. That's Sermon 7. Now you already know. Come that week anyway. Let's spend a little bit of time in prayer. Asking God to help us keep his fame as central to our lives. Our prayer today is this. God, help us to keep your fame as central to our lives. God, help us to keep your fame as central to our lives. We want, we want our lives' purpose. We want our lives' purpose to be about the fame of God. Would you take just a moment right where you are with your family, with your friends, or by yourself, and just say, God, help us to keep your fame as central to our lives. Not ours, not our recognition, not our image, but yours. Continuing in an attitude of prayer, would you take a moment and would you ask that God, would you thank God rather, that our ordinary lives have extraordinary purpose? Thank God that your life gets to be about making the God of the universe known, that your life gets to image him and glorify him. Take a moment to do that.
finally, as we finish up in prayer this morning, would you take just a moment and just thank God that our ability to image him and glorify him is found in Jesus and not ourselves. This isn't about your strength. This isn't about your failures. This is about who God is. Remember, he has made you to image him. He has made you to glorify him, but he's also made the way for that to happen. And it's through faith in Christ. Take a, take a moment to thank God that, that he has made a way for you to glorify him through Jesus.